Tam, we're, Sam, we're on the uh, second tape now, and I uh, just wanted to add that this is April 8th of 2013, and we're interviewing Samuel, Sam Duran, uh, in Louisville for the Louisville Museum. So I, I want to know about the, the pigeon stories. I think there's some wonderful stories. Oh, there. yeah. We got pigeons and raised them, and... So let's talk about you were you were about in what sixth grade or fifth grade, grade sixth grade. Uh -huh. Okay, it happened along those two years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't explain how I really got into them, but uh, I know I like pigeons. So the guy there was a man down the street here, three houses down. His name was Saki. I think he was French. Saki was his last name? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot of pigeons. Mm -hmm. So I asked him one time, well, where'd you get those pigeons? He said, well, I started raising them, and then they got too much, and I let them out of the pen, and they hang around here. I said, okay. So So where do they hang around? <laughs> yeah. So I said to myself, you know, I could give me a bunch of pigeons from the elementary school if I could get up on the roof. You know, mm -hmm. you knew there there were pigeons. Out yes, there. right in the belfry, there were, uh -huh. where the bell was at. Uh -huh. And how they were getting in, I said, if they can get in now, there must be a way I can get in there to take them out. <laughs> so, I concocted a method here that my grandfather had a bunch of lumber here from buildings they tore down, you know, for firewood. So I walked up to the school, and I went up to what they call a fire escape slide on the east side of the oh, school. Oh, the, the, the big, sort of big tubes. Yeah, well, there. no, it was a tube, it was just yeah. regular yeah. slide. It was about yeah. three foot wide, uh -huh. you know, all metal. Were they fire escapes? Yeah, yeah. it was fire yeah. escape. This is yeah. the one at Memory Square. Pardon? This the is school. the school at Memory, Memory, Memory Square. Square. Yeah, right, mm -hmm. that's where yeah. it was at. So I went up there and got up on, well, I climbed the stairs, actually. So got up there, and it wasn't that high. It looked to be like about five or six foot tall from the platform to the roof. Mm. I said, uh -huh. <laughs> So I come home, <laughs> pull the nails out of these old two bodies and everything, and get grandfather's hammer and start making me a ladder. The ladder was about seven foot long. Might have been eight foot, I don't know. But it was awful yeah. heavy. So I figured, well, in the evening time when it starts getting a little Dusk, I'll take it up to the school. Carry the ladder up there? All the way up Spruce Street. Did anybody say anything <laughs> to you? What did, what did you you like know, I, I would never see anything or anybody watching me. <laughs> they probably said, who's that stupid kid going up there with a the ladder? <laughs> but nobody nobody stopped you or something. Nobody anything. stopped me or questioned me, not even <laughs> Ring <Rindanigi. laughs> So I'm going up there and I'm sliding the... And he was the police chief or, or on the police... Well, yeah, he was yeah. a main yeah, dude here. Yes. He was a number one <laughs> cop. Enforcer. Yeah. <laughs> so I slide it up and push it up the, the fire escape mm -hmm. slide, get to the top, bring it around and shove it up there and it, up on the roof from the platform to the roof. I said, hey. So I went up there and got in there and said, yeah. You know, all them pigeons are in there. And a lot of them had babies and a lot of them had mm -hmm. eggs. So you had to be careful of what to step on and what not. And how do you identify who's, who, uh, yeah. who has the chicks already and who's laying the eggs? Yeah. So I grabbed me a couple and put them on my shirt and came back down and said, I got to have something that I can put these pigeons in when I come get them. So. With that, I left the ladder there, brought the pigeons home, and shoved them in a little chicken coop my grandfather had back here. Next day, build me another ladder, you know. This time <laughs> I got me a gunny sack. Here I go. A whole other ladder, you see, so. Probably seven foot, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they were very wide. And people thought, this guy's got a job roofing or something. He keeps going up to all these ladders. <laughs> Or he's doing something Even up there. Even though, though he's only a sixth, sixth grader or seventh grader. Yeah, fifth, sixth, fifth and sixth grade. Yeah. So I really hit the bonanza. I brought home about eight pigeons that time. Put them in a chicken coop. My grandfather comes in. Where are all these pigeons coming from? He says, I'm 
getting them from where? Uptown. Where? At the school. Really? How are you getting them? I said, well, I just get them. He didn't ask me no more questions. So this went on for a week. So I thought, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't ask somebody if I can get up there. Mr. Barbero lived on, uh, was it Lincoln and Short? Somewhere up on the hill. Mm -hmm. The principal. Yeah. Knocked on his door and said, yeah, what can I do for your kid? He says, uh, do you mind if I get pigeons off of the, the bell tower at the grade school? He kind of looked at me and says, thinking, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Take all you want. He didn't really believe it was happening. No, he didn't believe that I could. How would you want to get up there, pal? Fly? He says, yeah, that's fine. You sure? Yeah, OK. Thank you. OK. <laughs> went home, got my ladder, and went up there. So this was the last time I was able to get up there. Because the next day I went back, got up there. I heard this kid say, hey, get down from there. We didn't need you. Uh-oh. <laughs> I said, what? Get down from there. I said, no, Mr. Barbero said I could get the page. He said, I don't care if God said you can. I want you down now. I said, well, I ain't going to argue with this big looking dude. You know, throw me in jail. So what do you got in the bag? Nothing. Whatever you got in the bag, dump it out. <laughs> Kitchen's flying. <laughs> he said, you get down from there, and you throw that ladder off. I don't want to see you here anymore. OK. Never went back. So, so about how many pigeons had you Oh, I got about oh, a couple of dozen. Wow. Yeah. But there were chickens in the chicken coop, and you put yes, them in with the pigeons. Right. Uh -huh. So I figured, well, he says, I can't come up here anymore, but the Methodist church across the street, <laughs> there's a belfry and there's pigeons. <laughs> so I said, well, I'll give that a try. So I just wait till he left and put my gang sack. And that church was easier to get onto because it had a railing. And then they had the gutter. It wasn't more than three, four foot difference. So there were no pigeons in there. They were just landing on the roof, you know, Part-time oh. taking off. So that was pretty much the end of my yeah. pigeon gathering. So when a train depot used to be here, I can't recall a man's name, but he used to raise show pigeons called uh, crown pigeons, beautiful birds. They had a crown like so around their head. On their feet, they had like booties, the big long feathers stuck out like that. And they call them, uh, a show pigeon also was a fantail, or the, they had a tail like a, like a turkey, you know, fan out like that. So I was walking past one of my dad and said, hey, come in here. Yeah, what? You like pigeons? I said, yeah. He said, I noticed you got a lot of birds over there. He says, uh, would you be interested in raising some show pigeons if I give you a pair? Oh, yeah, you know, I wasn't going to refuse anything like that. And he lived over there off of uh, Rex, was it Rex in county line, country line? Somewhere in that area. He had a pen back at this house. I think where the Carancy house is at back there, he was like two doors over to the west. And he had a pen back there with all these fancy looking birds. So he says, uh, come on over later and I'll get you a pair. I did that. Brought them home, threw them in the pen. So my grandfather says, you know, the pigeons are interfering with my chickens. <laughs> you know? And again, to be too crowded, that pen wasn't that big, you know, the coop. Uh, uh. So you're gonna have to let these out because they've been here long enough and they I'm sure they'll acclimate with you know the area. I didn't want to do that because I knew they would fly away. So Came home one day, he says, open that door. And I had uh, pigeons that were laying eggs already to brood. Open the door and they 
and start flying and circle around. And some left and some came back. So, well, the ones that came back stood back. So I came home one day and my grandfather and my dad were building me a pigeon run back there, you know. I said, man, that's great, you know. So they did that for me. So then my uncle knew Wysik. Bill Wysik, I think his name was. He lived on Front Street and Rex. He had pigeons, racing pigeons. It's interesting pigeons. to me that so many people were raising Yeah, homing pigeons, pigeons you know. Mm -hmm. He said, Sam, your uncle tells me you raise a lot of pigeons. I said, yeah. He said, would you want a couple of racing homing pigeons? They're oh. certified and they're banded and they're registered. I thought, wow. man, that's expensive. I said, how much you want from him? He said, no. He said, I'm giving them to you as a friend. Some nice people in the neighborhood. They was, <laughs> yeah. Really. So yeah. he gave them to me, and I yeah, threw them in there, and they did their thing. Yeah. And uh, I think it was the same guy who gave me the uh, show pigeons, had some pigeons they called tumblers. What's that? A tumbler is a pigeon that'll fly up in the air like this and loop and it'll come down the same way until they get so close to the ground then they pull out, you know? Swoop up again. Yeah. Well, he also gave me a pair of those. So I had all kinds of birds in here. And if that wasn't enough, uh, I worked for Mr. Hoyt. He was a banker here in town. And uh, he says, I need you to come up and help me clean out my pigeon run. I said, okay, I can do that. You know. He was raising pigeons also? Yeah. King <laughs> pigeons. They were like a chicken. They were <laughs> about that tall. You know, they walked more than they would fly. You know, they were big birds. They would fly, but they preferred walking. I always thought there was one kind of a pigeon. I no. didn't realize it was so, all these different kinds. He says, uh, so he paid me. I said, you know, I would like a pair of those king pigeons if you you know, take this money that I earned. He said, no, he says, keep your money, take the pigeons, whatever you want. Yeah. So they were buggers trying to catch him. They would walk, but you go up to them, they take off, you know, so yeah. I had to go in the pen fighting them. They're like a, if you tackle with a geese or a goose, they just slap the hell out of you, you know, with their wings. That's all these birds were. But you could put all of these different kinds of pigeons in the same oh, pen. No. They were okay yeah. together. They didn't, you know, they were territorial. I mean, yeah. you didn't bother the nest over here yeah. where they were roosting, you know, they would uh -huh. fight each other and sometimes they'd fight over a female, but that's how those guys are. You know? <laughs> but but yeah. they, didn't, they didn't interbreed though. No, no, uh, no. So with that, you know, pretty much my pigeon career was over. I used to subscribe to some company back in Chicago that sent out information on pigeons and different kinds of pigeons and uh, the breeds and how far they go back and what they were used for and all this other stuff. And uh, uh, pretty much my dog ended my pigeon career. Your dog? My dog, uh, yeah. Was so, this the same dog? That, no. Oh, okay. He, he, Red had died already. Because uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, reverting back to uh, the grade school, elementary school, I had a dog called Ace. Well, that was my brother's dog. And uh, my brother would loan him out to Ring Deniji because if there was a rat infested house, he'd ask my brother George to borrow Ace, was the dog's name, to go. To go, did he kill the rats? Get the rats. Okay. Uh. So uh, he was doing that for a long time, and then when he left for the service, he left the dog with me. So we were pretty close. So that was Ace. Yeah. And uh, I was in the sixth grade, he was here, when he had fits and he died. So oh, everybody was crying. I was crying, my grandma was crying, my sister was crying, you know. Uh -huh. You know, a long lost pet like that, you're never gonna replace. So <laughs> I went to school. And come lunchtime, there was a puppy running around the school grounds. And he looked just like the one I just lost. And I was asking, who owns this dog? Kids didn't care, I don't know, I don't know. So I scooped him up and brought him home. <laughs> exact same dog he grew up to be. Is oh, the one that died. Same color, 
Ah. And I named him Ace. And so this was Ace number two. Number two, two right. Ah. So ah. being as honored as he was, mm -hmm. he's the one who got into my oh, pigeon pen with the door open and he's yeah. playing, supposedly, but he yeah. hurt a lot of them and he killed a lot of them. Oh. So they all dispersed. And pretty much they so never. So they flew away, the ones that yeah, right. didn't get there. They right. They all flew away and never came back. And they were too afraid or whatever. Right. So, so. That was the end. So what did you take up then? Uh, you, you got into cars, right? Yes, I did. Uh, well. You were a teenager then, by then, or just you? Yeah. I, uh, my brothers and father and uncles and cousins and everybody was musically inclined. Mm -hmm. You know, my grandfather would have a party when we lived on Front Streets, you know. Uh -huh. All the people here in town, Lafayette, Erie, Frederick. Come over and, and they, have music? Yeah, that, they'd have uh, the biggest shindigs, you know. Yeah. Now, I don't know how well, well it went over with the city of Louisville, but that didn't stop him. Ring didn't come around. Well, he did. <laughs> He'd come over <laughs> snooping around, but he would, you know. He got <laughs> too drunk and unruly. He grabbed by the collar, throw him. He used to drive a 40, I think a 1944 <laughs> truck. Uh -huh. Not a car, a truck. Yeah, yeah. He'd get in the back. <laughs> Guys, voluntarily, they crawl in the back of the truck and he'd haul their butts out to jail and keep them there overnight. But yeah, they were all musically inclined, so I pretty much learned from them and I bought my first guitar through the catalog. Uh -huh. Montgomery Ward. Uh, this was 59 when I bought it. I can't recall how much I paid for it. It wasn't that expensive, mm -hmm. you know. So that held my interest for a while, you know, learning how to play and this yeah. and that. Yeah. And then. Uh, so did you play at those, some of those parties and gatherings of family or? Well, I did here, yeah. you know, uh -huh. for Christmas yeah. and all. My uncle would uh -huh. sing and my uncle Joe would play yeah. and my brother would sing and play. Even my grandmother would sing a song or so, you know? Oh, and she wonderful. learned, yeah, she learned yeah. the guitar. My grandfather never did. Did, did they speak Spanish? Yes. Or, or mostly Spanish in the home? Or? Well, you know, my grandmother preferred Spanish because uh -huh. that's how they were brought up. I spoke Spanish. Uh, yeah. I still do. Yeah. But, you know, to connect with my grandfather and right. my grandmother yeah. and a lot of relatives, but she spoke English uh -huh. when she, okay. she didn't yeah. care to, but my grandfather was fluent and he spoke a lot of Italian too in, in mm. Spanish. Mm. So he could, he could you know, uh -huh. talk with the Italians here yeah. in town. So uh, I guess that's one thing that yeah. you... So your grandfather, he was quite an interesting person. It sounds, he was, yeah. yeah. It's like he had a lot of interests and... He, uh, you know, I've got pictures of him when they yeah. were down in Southern Colorado. Uh -huh. They're out there, cattle herding and all this other stuff. <laughs> the horses they rid out there were kind of, I used to call them generic because they looked so <laughs> wasted. Yeah, you know? mangy. Yeah, mangy looking, real skinny and all this stuff. Here they are sitting on top of those with their hats on and then all just yeah. posing, you know, looking good. I thought, man, that's really something. <laughs> but yeah, he, uh, yeah. you know, he took care of us, okay. you know, yeah. when, yeah. Jobs were scarce and all this other mm -hmm. stuff. My Uncle Jess used to tell me to bring tears to his eyes. He says, when I was a kid and I wanted to go to the movies, they had no money. He said, and Grant, and it, well, father, his dad, my grandfather, yeah. he would go around collecting bottles, rags, mm -hmm. cans, whatever, to sell over here to trot mm -hmm. to give me enough money and some to go to the movies. So he would do that, yeah. you know. So that apple tree that sits there on the side of the hill yet, that sucker's got to be 100 years old. Because when I was a kid living over there, we'd come over here and try to take apples from that tree, you know, even though they were a little bit of thing and full of worms. Trot, he's probably teasing us. Hey, get away from that tree. The apples are mine. You kids can't have any of that stuff. Okay, keep your apples, you know. <laughs> and they're still growing today, and they're still producing so apples. Over there by the, by the track. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. By the track right there. Yeah. Uh, Otto Pine? 
Right next yeah, to the pine? Yeah, right before you go up the hill, you'll see a tree right there on the side of the hill <laughs> in, in the yard. That's the old apple tree that's been there forever. You know, as scraggly as it is, and it still produces good apples. So what, uh, your, your father actually worked on the railroad. Yes, he did. Okay. He, uh, he worked in a monarch mine, uh -huh. uh, coal mining, second ships. And uh, I remember that when he come home all smelly and darked up and all the stuff, and he had his beer bucket, well, his lunch bucket. Mm -hmm. His beer bucket mm -hmm. with him. And uh, about the time that that explosion happened over there, he was set to go to work, and they informed him that not to come to work because of that. Mm. He says, I'm quitting. Wow. I'm not going back. Yeah. So he got a job with the railroad, Rio Grande, Burlington, whatever it was. And he was living in a house already. Mm -hmm. And when he'd go to work, the depot was there, they had an outhouse, and then they had a little rail car shack where they kept the rail car that goes on the tracks, maintenance, in that shed. He'd come out of there, you know, unlock the shed. Him and another guy would shove that cart to the track, pick it up and put it on the track and go to work. So were those the carts that they sort of pumped? No, th this was a motorized car. It was already. motorized. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. And and there were several people that would they would go out and repair the tracks. Right. And, stuff and maintain them. Uh -huh. You told about an accident. There. Yeah. Uh, they wanted him to be a foreman and a supervisor, mm -hmm. and he didn't have the schooling. That's what held my dad back. Mm -hmm. So the guy they hired had a schedule to keep and times the train would come by and times that would they would drive so far on on the track mm -hmm. and at some point they had stopping areas they were just square spots with not gravel but that red ash sitting on there so they could take the car off and set it on there and let the train go by oh, uh -huh. and they would know the schedule of the train right so, so this time something happened and it was per up pretty close to long one i believe that train coming around the bend there or they didn't see it and they just jumped off and the train wow. hit that. Well my dad got a concussion out of that, a bad head injury. Yeah. Uh, this was probably 54, no I take that back. That was after my grandfather passed away in 56, must have been about 57. So the pain in his head would never go away and they take x-rays and they found that he had some kind of brain damage because of that accident. Uh -huh. so oh, he, concussion. Yeah, so he retired from uh, the, uh, the railroad. Uh -huh. I think How he old was he then? Let's see, he passed, he died at a very early age. He died at age 67. So it must have been, he died in 69. 67, probably 60, mm -hmm. maybe, mm -hmm. you know, 61, yeah, 62, yeah, yeah. something like that. But they could have all been killed. If, yeah, right. If they hadn't dived off of that. If they haven't jumped off, they would have been dead, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's something for a person to take yeah. his life. And that happened very near Louisville then? No, it was yeah. further up north, probably 10 miles out of town. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. So. Uh, but he had an in interesting job. You know, yeah, I always yeah. wanted to write on that thing. Oh, yeah. no, you can't well, you told them. about the uh, seeing the, uh, the, was it a diesel engine that came through, the Silver Streak? Yeah, it was a brand new diesel, the Silver Streak or Silver, whatever. Yeah. You know, what I question is, a lot of people, I don't know if they ever remember that. Yeah. Now, am I fantasizing, thinking that something happened like this? Because... I've I don't never think ever so. heard. You, you remember it pretty yeah. vividly. I've never heard of anybody else talking about that. Now, yeah. a lot of stuff used to happen along this track that yeah. I was aware of, yeah. and these well, other you people. Were so close. That, yeah. You know. And these people over on the other side are probably working and all this other stuff. So, right. yeah. Yeah. you know, but I remember it coming through and stopping right there, and we got mm -hmm. to get on it, and everything was silver the passenger cars, the train, uh, the first uh, diesel, and you know. 
entered yeah. into the race here. Oh, so, that was exciting. Yeah, it was. You know, the same way when the soldiers would come by and, and mm -hmm. the extra gang would park there and all this other mm -hmm. stuff. So I thought, man, that's pretty <laughs> neat. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but then they never used it on this line. No, nah, no. They, they were, were still showing, into showing it off. Yeah, they were yeah. still into the coal-fired yeah, smoking yeah. trains, yeah, you know. Yeah. Huh. So, but that was a diesel. Yeah. yeah. And I remember my grandma would say, we're going to Boulder. We are, because mm -hmm. we had an aunt that lived in Boulder. Mm -hmm. And the train would come and stop. Mm -hmm. Let all passengers, passengers would get on and they'd go to Boulder backwards. Mm -hmm. We'd go all the way to Boulder backwards, go all the way up Water Street. And the depot used to be on Broadway and Water Street yeah, back I then. I remember that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So back up, we'd get off, mm -hmm. and they'd take off again. So well, that was really a neat way of traveling. You were going to the big city. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I hated about the train, well, we'd catch it here to go to uh, Walsenburg, mm -hmm. Trinidad. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. And, uh, you still had relatives down there? Yes. Uh -huh. Garcia's. Oh. They're a spinoff of my grandfather's sister. Oh. Her family, Garcia's. Because uh -huh. they used to live not a sister, but her son used to live between Joel's white friend and uh, the bank there in the alley. You know where the uh, Huckleberries is at now? Yeah. Well, to the east, right along that space, there used to be a house there, a rental. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it had a, a iron fence in the front of it, and the Garcia used to live there. So. Uh, they were cousins. So when you when you took the train, you take the train from here, go into Denver, yes, and change, and then you well, all the way not so much change. We stay on the same okay on the same train. Yeah. And it, Went all the way to Wilsonburg. Yeah. yeah, and other times we take it to uh, Fort Garland because my uncle lived in San Luis Valley. They didn't have a train that went there. It just mm -hmm. dropped off at Gor Fort Garland, and he'd pick us up there. Uh, Grand Junction, we took the bus. We didn't have a train to Grand Junction. Well, yeah, mostly south, mm -hmm. you know. And I would get travel sick on that thing, you know. <laughs> just America, America, America. And my grandmother, she'd, she'd make chicken and she'd boil eggs and she'd have this uh, yeah, and that. Yeah. She asked me in Spanish, ¿Qué es comer? Mm -mm, I don't want to eat. <laughs> no way, you know. So, <laughs> You were train sick. <laughs> yeah, motion sick. Yeah. So I said, oh, it's too, it's fun right from here to Boulder, but not that long, 300 and some miles. That, that's a long trip. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, not for me. Yeah, but some wonderful experiences yeah. there, no matter what. So. And what it, well, it was even worse than that was yeah. the bus going to Grand uh, Junction. Yeah. Shift up and down. You know what long Shifting bus up rides are and like. down. Yeah, and it's bad. Hearing and smelling it up and down. Mm -hmm. It's already an easier way to travel nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> well, that goes to when you started getting your own car. Oh. But I want to hear the, oh, okay. the, the yeah. story of that first car. <laughs> yeah, it was a 1929 or 30, I believe, Model A. And I was into cars because my brothers had them and everybody else had them. So my brother, he'd buy a car every other month, you know, $50 or whatever. Yeah. He pulled in the yard and I said, show me how to drive. He said, no, you're too young. They don't want to waste their time with me. Was this Jess? Jess no, Jess, my brother Jess, Manuel. Manuel. One day he pulled in with a 54 or he pulled in with a 39 Buick or a 48 Chevy or something. Mm -hmm. So one day he had this 46 Chevrolet sedan. And he was bragging about it that it had a hydraulic clutch. You didn't have to use a clutch to shift. You could just step on the gas, give it a little rib and shift the gears. Mm. I said, oh, okay. You like that. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't know how to drive. So they were all celebrating over to tracking and they left the key in it. And there was nothing in the backyard anymore, you know, just straight away. Yeah. All the way across over the ditch. All that was my grandfather's property at one time. All of this back here across the ditch. So I got in there. You're talking like from Pine to Spruce Street. Yeah. 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 Oh. 
So I got in the car and started it up. And Were you one. about 13? Or? No, I was like 16. 16, okay. I the car and started it up and hit the clutch and put it in gear and took off, just peeling that like crazy. Wow, you know, stop, grind the gears, put it back in reverse, come back. <laughs> I got to knack it finally, you know. Yeah, yeah. I had to shift it, so. Yeah. Parked it where it was. Brother come home and, what's all them tire tracks? Uh -oh. Into the. <laughs> oh, I was trying out your car. You know how to drive it? Yeah. Oh, good. He got in and left. He didn't care. <laughs> you know? So, with that, I had an uncle. I'd have to update this car thing because I was a sophomore in high school. My uncle worked out a. Uh, he had a job up in Wigan somewhere. He said, I found this old car for you, you know, and the guy wants to get rid of it. And it runs and everything, but it's, the top is out of it because it caught fire. That was the Model A? Yes, the Model A. He says, if you want it, I'll bring it home. It cost you 50 bucks. I said, okay. So I anticipated just waiting for that car, and I was upstairs. And he used to work the night shift, 12 o'clock to whatever. I had my windows open and everything, just leaning my ear against the outside, waiting for that car. First thing I heard, click, 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 click. The old Model A just chugging it and he took it to his house over there. He didn't park it here, he took it to his home over there. Man, I got out of bed and dressed up and run down there. Here it is. He says, uh, okay, show me how to drive it. I ain't got time now, I'm tired. You know, come back later for whatever. So I said, well, let's see. Go back to this. I can drive this thing. I'll take it home. Suit yourself. And I brought it home. Old so raggedy this was piece the of junk. car without a top? Right. Been... Well, it had the cab, but the roof had burned out of it. Whatever, these new cars. <laughs> that was out of it. But it, uh -huh. it would have been damaged and all this stuff. So uh, I fixed it up a little bit and, and bought some accessories from Del Pizzo who used to live on the south in Pine, south in Maine, Del Pizzo. Yes. Yeah. South in Maine. Yeah. He uh, sold me some wheels and tires for, you know, 50 cents a piece or two dollars worth. Perfect. Put those new, on my car. New ones or? Yeah. Uh, and uh, put those on my vehicle and did some other stuff. And I got tired of it because it just wasn't. Uh -huh. What I wanted. So next door neighbor, Emil Dangrum, he was an iron worker, ornamental iron worker, and he had a shop across the street. On the other side of Pine. No, I take that back. He had a shop north of uh, Steinball at an old foundry that used to sit on the corner, okay. a green building that sat on the corner of uh, Front Street and South, Public, South Street. Walnut. Right across, yeah. pretty much catty corner with the library. Yeah. Uh, there was Steinballs, George Lucas. He was a he worked with my dad also on the railroad. Mm -hmm. A Greek, they call him the Greek. And then that foundry, I think it was blacksmithing. That's what it was, the blacksmithing building. And I think uh, Steinballs maybe had that blacksmith too. But he opened up his ironworks there, and it just wasn't big enough. So, uh, at the time, there was nothing across the street but an old county, Boulder County maintenance garage, where they had the graders and the tractors and stuff, and a house that sat there. And somebody lived in that house, but I can't recall who it was. You know, that was he was old already, and I didn't. I wasn't aware of what his name was. So when they tore that down, the name of the gas company, EG&G or GIG, something like that, built that center block building. That's now part of Umberto's uh, property over there. As a gas recycling plant, they thought it was really big industry coming into Louisville. I mean, you know, 
and gas recycling, acetylene and oxygen and all that stuff that they bottled, plant. They just want to create jobs for the city of Louisville and all this stuff. You know, one man operation. So. <clears throat> Is that close to the tracks? Then? Yeah, it's right there in the right, corner. Right across. Yeah. And right, right across the street, yeah. right there. Yeah. So, with that, it lasted about a year until they started getting into trouble. This, we'd be outside, and this guy come running out of the building, telling everybody to run. <laughs> run, run, run for your lives! Time. Yeah, he's, what? Wow. He says, "I got a tank that got loose, and it may explode." So, <laughs> man, like a bunch of fools are running to the backyard. My grandmother's older; she was. I'm helping her. So it fizzled out. And about that time, the city said, that's it. These operations are leaving town. What, what year was this? 58, 59. I'd say 58, 59. Hmm. <laughs> so, you run them out of town. Yeah. So this big dude, there still wasn't anything across the street. This big guy who was... He's kind of like that uh, Mr. Clean looking dude, you know, uh, bald headed <laughs> earring, you know. He thought he'd open a flea market over here. Yeah. And he had some things going, you know. And that didn't work out, about a year. So then Amo bought that building. And that's where he started his ironworks, oh, okay. ornamental, oh. patios, and uh -huh. gates. And uh -huh. he got a lot of stuff all over town. And, Boulder County and all that stuff. So he was very good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he built a lot of patio covers like you see down the street. Mm -hmm. There's one, two, three, four of them, you know, mm -hmm. porch yeah, covers. Yeah. Yeah. So he told me at one time. He wanted to buy that car? No, he wanted, he was an avid sport, uh, hunter. Mm -hmm. He said, I know of an old junker that's got a good top on it. He says, when I'm out there sometime, he said, I'll mm -hmm. cut the top off and we'll weld it to yours. <laughs> I said, really? You do that for me? He said, yeah, we're pretty good friends. So he did that. And then before that, I had cut the rest of that top off. Uh -huh. And I was right here behind the house working on my car. Didn't have a top on it. It looked like a convertible. And this guy come roaring by. All of a sudden, I heard his, er, he backed up. I said, hey, is that your car? I said, yeah. He said, I got a beautiful 30 Model 8. He says, you want to trade for that convertible? What convertible? He says, ain't that your car? I says, yeah. That convertible? I says, no. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> he lives off of a... Uh, he uh, thought he was going to get a deal there. <laughs> yeah, off of Roosevelt in... Is it Elm? A brick house such... Across from that nursing home or whatever it is, as you yeah. go turn going south, there's a right across from the Elks uh, Club. There's a yellow nursing home there, old folks home or something that sits on the corner. He sits right across. His sister-in-law lives right up one. Barbara, what's her name? Last name lives up there on Front Street, top of the hill. Barbara, Barb. Not talking about Barb Hesson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, Jan, yeah. Jan Smith. Yeah. yeah okay. He's married to her sister. Lives at Brick House. She's the one who had the Model A. Oh, Jonesy. Yeah, is that her name? I don't. Uh, no, Barb. Barb. Uh, Heston. Huston. Barb Heston's sister's name Jan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Jones. They kind of look alike to me. Same well, building. So he's the he's the one that that didn't buy it because of, yeah because yeah, it okay. wasn't a convertible. Okay, but you did sell it then later to somebody yeah, else. Yeah, twice, three times, really. Actually, I traded it to Kurt Schreider. Okay. Uh huh. And uh, his dad said, "No, you can't have that car," so he brought it back. <laughs> then I sold it to this other guy for a hundred dollars. <laughs> Took you a while. Yeah. He wrote yeah. me a check. Mm -hmm. A week later, it came back because his check bounced. Then I sold it against these couple of kids that want to make a hot rod out of it. I said, I want the money in hand this time. Uh, right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, give us a day to get it. A hundred bucks back there was pretty good money, mm -hmm. you know. So did you stick with Model A's then? Or no. what, because you did no. classic? No. You, I, yeah. I yeah. went to a different car. Mm -hmm. Did you mm -hmm. ever uh, 
know Fred McNulty and his models, Model A? Oh, yes, He's, yeah. What, what did you do with him with, with those cars? You know, Fred was a cop. And, well, he enforced the law. And I had a suspended license at one time. And he would watch me all the time. Him, Arlo Wilson, would watch me all the time. And they knew I had a suspended license, but you know what? They didn't bother me. So, actually, you know, I wasn't really aware. I knew what Fred had, because I knew his model lace, and he had a really cute daughter. Bubbles, they used to call her. And uh, he had a beautiful 55 Ford. What they, they auctioned all that stuff off when he died as a state. And I really didn't get friendly with Fred up till about four or five years ago. He knew I was into cars. He'd come down, you know, we talked cars and all this other stuff. And I knew what he had. And he had some nice looking Model A's. You know, he had a, a four door that was really a limited edition. He kept it in a separate garage, and he had some other ones, you know. And I wasn't really into Model A's, other than the one I had, because they were just too rickety and too slow. And, what you did know. you get into? I got into a, a 47 uh, Mercury Coupe mm -hmm. with a racing flathead, you know, three-speed. <laughs> Beautiful car. And. Uh, that you were was still my, in your teens then? When, I was in my junior year when I bought that. Uh, it took a while to graduate, you know, from cars because of the money-wise. Sure. <laughs> at the time, I was working at Kalachis, you know, and uh, I bought that car. And everybody liked it. Even Anthony said, man, Sam, you got a nice-looking car there. I said, thanks. And the guy who didn't like it was, uh, uh, what the hell was it? He worked for Kalachis. I can't think of his name. Anyhow, I parked the car in front of Kalachi's, uh, right. you know, out of sight, the window, so I could watch it. And he come over and said, Sam, is that your car? I says, get the hell out of there. Why? You're taking up a customer's parking spot, that's why. Really? Yeah. Now get it out of there. Okay. I tell you, parked across the street in front of the Rex Theater. <laughs> so here, that's a better view from my car from here anyway, you know. So then from there I got, you know, the 49 really Fords. really got into uh, yeah. collecting cars. And, yeah. yeah. All 4950 yeah. Fords graduated oh, okay. up to, the only Chevrolet I ever had was, uh, I was out of school, I was 58 and Paul, a convertible, and then Mustangs and... Uh -huh. Mustangs and also, well, you get married, you get rid of the sports cars, you go to a family car, also builds up to the date. I still got all some oldies in the garage, you know. That I